Hey there, it's Kathy. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to History of the 90s early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. 1994 was a year when peace seemed possible. Nelson Mandela took office in South Africa, and Israel began withdrawing from the Gaza Strip. But then a horrible genocide destroyed a small African country. Meanwhile, in North America, we were captivated by a string of sensational crimes that ranged from ridiculous to horrific. I'm Kathy Kinzora, and this is History of the 90s, a podcast about a decade that changed the world. In this episode, we'll take a look back at those stories and several others as we count down the most memorable events of 1994. Number 10, a deadly earthquake in Southern California. Around 4.30 in the morning on January 17, 1994, a magnitude 6.8 earthquake awakened terrified Los Angeles residents with a violent convulsion that flattened freeways, sandwiched buildings, and ruptured pipelines. Lasting between 10 and 20 seconds, it was the strongest earthquake in LA's modern history, and it left emergency crews scrambling to rescue people trapped under the rubble. The quake was triggered by a fault that squeezed the northern San Fernando Valley between two mountain ranges like a vice, with the epicenter located in the L.A. neighborhood of North Ridge. Sixty people were killed, including 16 who were pulled from the remains of a collapsed apartment building in North Ridge. Fifty miles away in Anaheim, the 17-ton Jumbotron at Angel Stadium tumbled from its rooftop mooring into the stadium's upper deck. It crushed and damaged about 1,000 seats in the left field stands. Luckily, no one was injured, but had that earthquake struck during a game by the Los Angeles Angels or the Rams, it could have been a horrific scene. Even still, as the sun came up, aerial news footage revealed a hellscape in Southern California. As fires from broken gas mains blazed while water from broken water mains flooded streets, In some areas, it looked like flames were actually shooting out of the water. And most striking were the multiple elevated highways and freeway overpasses that were turned into crumpled piles of concrete, with crushed cars visible underneath. The scene is northbound 5 and the southbound 14. The overcrossing of the southbound 14, as you can see here, has actually collapsed and pancaked atop the northbound lanes of the Golden State Freeway. At that location, an LAPD motorcycle officer flew over the edge of the severed off-ramp and plunged to his death. On the Santa Monica Freeway, one of the busiest highways in the U.S., an overpass buckled like a wave, dropping to about six feet from street level. A four-level intersection collapsed where the Golden State and Antelope Valley freeways cross, crushing cars and leaving steel-reinforced concrete splayed at crazy angles. As a result, the U.S. city, most defined by its cars and interlocking highways, was gripped with traffic chaos for months. The first night after the quake, over 20,000 people whose homes were damaged or who were simply too scared to return home slept outside in more than 70 parks throughout the city. Thousands more frazzled and displaced residents camped out on front lawns or driveways and parking lots and even on the median strips on roadways. The final damage cost was pegged at $25 billion. And among those impacted by the Northridge earthquake, was the animation team behind the Disney movie, The Lion King. If you've been listening to this podcast since the beginning, you might remember this was something we talked about in our second episode. When the quake struck in January 1994, the movie's scheduled release date was just six months away, and there was still lots of work to be done. Because of the highway chaos, the animators couldn't get to Disney offices, So they set up temporary studios in their garages and homes long before work-from-home arrangements were a thing. And amazingly, they got the job done on time for Lion King to roar into theaters on June 24th, 1994. The Disney classic went on to become the highest-grossing movie in 1994, ahead of Forrest Gump, True Lies, The Santa Claus, and The Flintstones. Number 9. Hollywood is rocked by the loss of a legendary comedic actor. Oh, 
Oh, that feels good. Oh, God, I'm telling you. My dogs are barking today. <sighs> After a long day of filming on March 3rd, 1994, John Candy had dinner and then called his kids to say goodnight. Candy, who started out on SCTV before shooting to fame in the 80s thanks to a string of hilarious movies like Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, was filming a new movie in a remote location near Durango, Texas. The actor didn't want to be there. After reading the script for Wagons East, Candy didn't like it. But because of some contractual obligations, he had no choice but to leave his wife and kids to begin shooting the movie. On the night he called home to say goodnight, he went to sleep in his trailer, and sometime in the night, he suffered a massive heart attack and died. John Candy was 43 years old. At his funeral a few days later, Dan Aykroyd delivered a five-minute eulogy for his friend at a church in Brentwood, California. The pews were filled with over 200 other mourners, including Chevy Chase, Bill Murray, Tom Hanks, and Wayne Gretzky. Wagons East was released six months later in August 1994, completed with new technology, which was somewhat controversial at the time. Director Peter Markle turned to several special effects houses and a candy lookalike to place the actor in a handful of scenes in which he never appeared. Critics in 1994 warned that the technology could be used to create images that look real but in fact are fake, and no one would be able to tell. Just imagine what they would say about what AI can do today. Wagons East turned out to be a bomb. Film critic Roger Ebert said it's possible that John Candy never appeared in a worse movie. Number 8. A Shocking Crime in the American South Captures the Nation's Attention just after 9 p.m. on October 25, 1994, a distraught young woman appeared at the front door of a rural home in Union, South Carolina. 23-year-old Susan Smith was hysterical. She pleaded for help, telling the home's owner that she'd been carjacked at a nearby deserted intersection. She said a black man with a gun had jumped into the front passenger seat and ordered her to drive about seven miles down the two-lane road. Then the gunman ordered her to stop at the entrance to John D. Long Lake. He told her to get out and then sped away with her two children in the back seat. Police were called and a frantic hunt began for three-year-old Michael and his 14-month-old brother, Alex. After 48 hours of searching and a thousand calls from as far away as California and New York, police still had very little to go on. An officer told the media it was like the two little boys dropped off the face of the earth. It was a shocking crime at any rate, but especially so for the sleepy textile community of Union. And as a result, the story became a national sensation. Reporters and TV crews from around the country descended on the small city 90 minutes north of Columbia. On day eight of the saga, with still no sign of the children, Susan Smith addressed the media outside the police station with her estranged husband, David Smith, by her side. Together, they made an emotional plea for the return of their little boys. I want to say to my baby, that your mama loves you so much, and your daddy and his whole families love you so much. And you guys have got to be strong because you are... We, 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 I just know, I just feel in my heart that you're okay. But you got to take care of each other. Susan and David were married three years earlier, but shortly before the alleged carjacking, they had filed for divorce and were living separately. Now they were united in their terror over Michael and Alex's fate. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, police were skeptical of Susan Smith's story. Some things just didn't add up. And when questioned, Smith changed some of the details of what happened. Then, on November 3rd, 1994, nine days after the disappearance, Union County Sheriff Howard Wells made a shocking announcement. Susan Smith has been arrested and will be charged with two counts of murder in connection with the deaths of her children, Michael, three, and Alexander, 14 months. The vehicle, a 1990 Mazda, driven by Smith, was located late Thursday afternoon in Lake John D. Long near Union. 
two bodies were found in the vehicle's back seat. An autopsy confirmed the bodies were Michael and Alex Smith. Earlier that day, Susan Smith broke down during a meeting with Sheriff Wells and confessed to what really happened. There was no kidnapping or carjacker. Smith said she parked her car on a boat ramp at John D. Long Lake. Her two boys strapped in their car seats in the back. She released the handbrake, then jumped out of the car, letting it roll into the lake with her children inside. At trial in July 1995, the prosecution revealed that Smith had previously had an affair with the son of her wealthy boss. But shortly before the boys died, the son ended the relationship with Smith because he didn't want to be involved with someone who had children. The prosecution accused Smith of being a cunning, cold-blooded killer who viewed Michael and Alex as obstacles to her failed love affair. But the defense argued that Smith had a history of mental illness following a turbulent childhood that included sexual abuse at the hands of her stepfather. And in fact, the night the boys died, the defense said Smith was in the midst of a psychotic breakdown and meant to kill herself as well, but changed her mind at the last minute. As a result, Smith's lawyer maintained she had committed involuntary manslaughter, not murder. In the end, the jury rejected that argument, and following two and a half hours of deliberation, it found Susan Smith guilty of murder. But she was spared the death penalty, instead sentenced to life in prison. Smith, who is now 52 years old, is eligible for parole in November 2024, 30 years after that fateful night in 1994. Number seven, an intractable labor dispute paralyzes Major League Baseball. Since 1904, the World Series has been a reliable tradition. Two world wars, the Depression, 9-11, and not even a worldwide pandemic could stop Major League Baseball's fall classic. But not so in 1994, when the World Series was canceled because of a player's strike. The walkout began on August 12th, with the major stumbling block to a settlement being the thorny issue of a salary cap. Owners claimed a cap was needed to save smaller teams from going bankrupt, while the players argued a cap would kill the free agent market. And they were confident the owners would cave into their demand to drop the salary cap to prevent the cancellation of the playoffs and the World Series. But the players were dead wrong. On September 14th, baseball commissioner Bud Selig made an announcement that stunned everyone. In an unprecedented decision, 26 of the 28 major league owners signed off on a resolution that canceled the rest of the 1994 season, including two rounds of playoffs and the World Series. I guess the only thing I have to say at the outset today is, um, like a lot of things in life, you um, anticipate something and fear that it's coming hope that it isn't, and when the day is here, uh, there's an incredible amount of sadness. The labor dispute continued until the next spring, when it was finally resolved by the courts. A U.S. district court issued an injunction brought by the Players Union that restored the collective agreement that was in place before the labor dispute started and players agreed to end their 232-day strike, finally returning to baseball diamonds in the U.S. and Canada on April 27, 1995, for a shortened season. But that doesn't mean fans were happy about it. For many baseball enthusiasts, the field of dreams had become the field of greed. And they showed their disapproval by turning away from the sport. Attendance in the 1995 season dropped by 20%. And it wouldn't begin to improve until 1998, thanks to the home run race between Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa. As for the players' contract negotiations, a new collective bargaining agreement was finally reached in March 1997. It included a revenue-sharing agreement, but there was not a salary cap for players. The MLB remains the only major league sport in North America without a cap. The NHL, NFL, and NBA all have one. And speaking of those other sports, let's take a look back at some of the champs from 1994. The Dallas Cowboys, powered by running back legend Emmett Smith, beat the Buffalo Bills 30-13 to win Super Bowl 28. 
It was a devastating loss for Bills fans who had watched their team make it to the championship game four years in a row without a win. Some believe it's a curse because the Bills haven't been back to the Super Bowl since that 94 game. In the NHL, the New York Rangers defeated the Vancouver Canucks in a thrilling seven-game series. Rangers captain Marc Messier scored the winning goal in the second period, ending the team's 54-year Stanley Cup drought. In Vancouver, drunken and disappointed fans went on a rampage following their team's defeat. They smashed windows, looted stores, and overturned cars for several hours after the final game. 20 people were injured and 150 were arrested in the Vancouver riot. And that wasn't the worst thing that happened in hockey in 1994. On October 1st, the NHL owners locked out players, resulting in a work stoppage that lasted until January 11th, 1995. As a result, the 94-95 hockey season was shortened to just 48 games. In the NBA, the championship in 1994 was won by the Houston Rockets, who defeated the New York Knicks in a seven-game series. It was the first ever NBA title for the Rockets, led by Hakeem Olajuwon, who was named the finals MVP. And 1994 was also an exciting year for North American soccer fans. The World Cup came to the United States for the first time in June and July. And by all accounts, it was a huge success, attracting a record attendance of 3.6 million spectators and global television audiences in the billions. Brazil was the ultimate winner, defeating Italy in a penalty shootout in the final at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California. The World Cup has not been back to North America since 1994, but get ready, the tournament will be played at venues in the US, Mexico, and Canada in 2026. Number six, one of the biggest sports scandals of the decade takes over the world. On January 6, 1994, US figure skater Nancy Kerrigan was in Detroit, preparing for the national championship set to take place two days later in the Motor City. She had won the previous year and was expected to repeat and earn a spot on the Olympic team. Around 2.30 in the afternoon, Kerrigan, dressed in an all-white skating dress, finished up a practice session, put on her skate guards, and left the ice at Kobo Arena. As she walked behind a blue curtain separating the rink from a hallway leading to the locker room, Kerrigan stopped momentarily to speak to a reporter. But before she could say anything, a guy in a leather jacket ran by, crouched down, whacked her with a baton on the lower right thigh of her landing leg, and kept running. Kerrigan dropped to the ground and started screaming. What The answer to the question why Nancy Kerrigan was attacked was more shocking than anyone could have imagined in that moment. And it played out like a real-life soap opera for the next several months, causing a media sensation. Luckily, though, 24-year-old Nancy Kerrigan didn't receive serious injuries from the attack. Yes, she had a severely bruised knee and quadriceps tendon, but no broken bones. Still, she had to sit out the U.S. Figure Skating Championships, which was won by her rival the scrappy underdog champion, Tanya Harding. The win secured a place for Harding at the 1994 Winter Olympics in Lillehammer. And even though Kerrigan didn't compete at the championships, the U.S. Figure Skating Association's International Committee voted unanimously to give her a spot on the Olympic team beside Harding should she be able to compete. In the meantime, they would also send an alternate 13-year-old Michelle Kwan. Then came the shocking news. There were allegations that people connected to Harding may have, in fact, orchestrated the attack on Kerrigan. On January 13th, a week after the mysterious attack, Harding's bodyguard, Sean Eckhart, was charged with conspiracy after confessing to police that he hired the two men who carried out the attack on Kerrigan. And Eckhart said he did it on orders from Harding's ex-husband, Jeff Galuli who wanted to ensure that Harding got a place on the Olympic team. In the days that followed, Galuli, along with the accused hitmen Derek Smith and Shane Stant, were also arrested and charged. The big question that remained on everyone's mind was whether Tanya Harding had anything to do with the attack. At first, she adamantly denied being involved. I don't know anything. I don't know 
for sure anything about what's going on at all. You know, and of course I'm going to cooperate. I mean, <laughs> I don't have anything to hide, and I want the person to be caught as much as anybody else does. But then when Galuli implicated his estranged wife, she admitted knowing about it, but only after the fact. Harding said she had no prior knowledge of what was going to happen to Kerrigan. In the meantime, the Winter Games in Norway were quickly approaching, and the question of whether Harding would or should still be allowed to compete consumed the public and the media. In the end, the U.S. Olympic Committee allowed Harding to remain on the team after her lawyers threatened legal action. When Harding and Kerrigan took to the ice at the same time during a practice session, a media horde was on hand to witness the interaction. 500 reporters, photographers, and TV crews jammed into a space suited for no more than 100. Then, on Friday, February 25th, drama ensued during the free skate program. Tanya Harding stopped mid-performance because of a broken skate lace. She looked down at her skate. It looked like she was uncomfortable, and I think she's going to quit. How devastating. Tearfully, Harding skated over to the judges and showed them the broken lace by propping up her foot on the edge of the boards. They gave her time to change the lace and restart her program, but it was no use. Harding ended up finishing in eighth spot. Nancy Kerrigan went home with a silver medal, following a surprise upset by the 16-year-old Ukrainian skater Oksana Bayul, who won gold. Chen Lu of China received the bronze. Meanwhile, back in the U.S. after the Olympics, Tanya Harding was charged with conspiracy to hinder a prosecution. She pleaded guilty on March 16, 1994, stating that she was confused and scared and as a result made a bad decision. Harding received three years probation and was slapped with a $100,000 fine. Plus, she had her 1994 national championship title revoked and she was banned from the U.S. Figure Skating Association for life. As for Jeff Galuli and the others, they each received jail sentences of between two years and 18 months. Number five, freedom reigns in South Africa. The long walk to freedom for Nelson Mandela culminated on May 10th, 1994, when he became the president of South Africa. Mandela's journey began in a rural village. It dealt with the oppression of apartheid, went through the turbulence of black township politics, persevered during 27 years of imprisonment, and finally reached triumph at the ballot box. At the age of 75, Mandela took the oath of office in front of a crowd of 50,000 people gathered for the historic occasion. It marked the beginning of a new South Africa, made possible when the ruling National Party ended 46 years of apartheid and released Mandela from prison. That was followed by the country's first democratic election held in April 1994, when Mandela's African National Congress Party won with 62% of the vote. Never, never, and never again shall it be that this beautiful land will again experience the oppression of one by another and suffer the indignity of being the skunk of the world. Mandela remained president until 1999, when he retired from politics. He remained active on the world stage until his death from a respiratory infection in 2013. Nelson Mandela was 95 years old. Number four, a step toward peace in the Middle East. On May 4, 1994, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat were in Cairo, Egypt, to sign an historic accord paving the way for Palestinian self-rule in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank town of Jericho. As part of the agreement, Israel pledged to begin withdrawing its army from the two areas they had occupied since the 1967 Middle East War. It was all part of a larger peace deal known as the Oslo Accord, which was signed by Rabin and Arafat at a landmark ceremony in Washington in September 1993. It set out the steps required to achieve lasting peace in the region. Israel lived up to its promise, beginning on May 25, 1994, withdrawing its army from Palestinian towns and refugee camps in the Gaza Strip and Jericho. 
Palestinians celebrated with cheers, hugs, and tears as power was transferred to the new Palestinian Authority. What had once seemed impossible was on the way to becoming reality. But peace was short-lived. The militant Palestinian organization Hamas began a campaign of suicide bombings as part of its opposition to the two-state solution. The following year, in November 1995, Israel's Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated by a Jewish extremist who was also against sharing the disputed land. Despite the groundwork laid in the 90s, peace in the Middle East remains more elusive today than it ever was. Number three, a genocide in the African nation of Rwanda. And a warning, this next story contains content that is graphic and violent in nature. In the country known as the Land of a Thousand Hills, an unimaginable horror began on the evening of April 6, 1994. That's when a plane was shot down near the Kigali airport, killing the president of Rwanda, who was a member of the Hutu ethnic majority in the East Central African nation. He had recently brokered a peace deal between the country's two ethnic groups, the Hutus and the Tutsis, which had been at odds for decades, devolving into a civil war in 1990. No one claimed responsibility for the attack that killed the president, and the initial belief was that a Tutsi-led rebel group called the RPF was responsible for shooting down the plane. But it is now widely suspected that the extremist Hutus were behind the attack, worried that the president was about to finally implement the peace accord they were against. Either way, the night marked the beginning of one of the darkest chapters in human history. Immediately after the president's assassination, the Rwandan army, who were mostly Hutu, seized control of the government. And with the help of the civilian militia group, the Interahamwe, they set up roadblocks around Rwanda's capital, Kigali, and filtered out Rwandans whose official ID cards listed them as Tutsis. Using the radio, Hutu extremists sent out a message asking Hutus to rise up against their neighbors, who they dehumanized and called cockroaches. As a result, extremists went house to house, bludgeoning to death thousands of people, checking off their list of Tutsis, as well as moderate Hutu politicians who had supported the peace accord. The scenes were horrific, and because there were only two international reporters on the scene in Rwanda when the massacre began, it would take weeks before the world would understand the full atrocity that was being unleashed. A United Nations mission of 2,500 troops was in the country to oversee the implementation of the peace accord when the atrocities began. But because they were under a strict mandate to use their weapons only in self-defense, they were powerless to stop the killings. When the mission's Canadian commander, Romeo Dallaire, asked for support, he was refused. Instead, the UN ordered an immediate withdrawal. Dallaire refused to leave, though, and the UN reluctantly gave him permission to stay in Rwanda with a tiny contingent of just 250 soldiers. One of their jobs was to guard the thousands of Tutsis who had gathered inside UN compounds and other places like churches, stadiums, and famously at a hotel, as depicted in the 2005 movie Hotel Rwanda. It's based on the amazing true story of a Hutu hotel manager who allowed Tutsis to take shelter inside the Hotel de Mille Collines. Outside the gates of the hotel, it was like hell on earth. Those who hadn't made it inside were hacked to death by machete, burned alive, or shot dead on the spot. Similar horrors took place around the country as the killings continued. Tens of thousands of rotting corpses are washing up on the Ugandan side of Lake Victoria. That prompted the government there to declare a disaster area because of the risk of disease. Officials are appealing for international assistance, saying they do not have the means to remove the dead bodies. The slaughter of Tutsis continued for a hundred days. That is until the Tutsi RPF, led by Paul Kagame, finally seized control of Kigali on July 4, 1994. By then, between 800,000 and 1 million people, mainly Tutsis, had been murdered. Up to 250,000 women were also sexually assaulted, many of whom were infected with HIV, and 95,000 children were left orphaned. 
Today, Paul Kagame continues to rule Rwanda. In the years since the genocide, his government has received praise for working to abolish the terms Hutu and Tutsi and to integrate the two cultures. But his government is also known for widely reported human rights abuses. Number two, the death of a reluctant music icon. On April 8, 1994, an electrician installing a security system at the Seattle home of Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love looked through the window of a greenhouse above the garage. What he saw sent shockwaves across the world. This is the latest from Seattle. A record company official says Nirvana lead singer Kurt Cobain shot himself to death at his Seattle home yesterday. When police say Cobain's body was found today with a shotgun wound to the head, a suicide note nearby. He had been recuperating from last month's overdose of painkillers and champagne. His mother says Cobain has been missing for six days. And she says the last time she spoke with her son, she told him not to join the stupid club of other rock stars who had died early. You might not remember this, but up to that point, Cobain had been missing for six days. He had checked himself out of rehab following an overdose in Rome the month before an overdose that some said was a suicide attempt. When Cobain returned from Rome, he was greeted by Courtney Love, Chris Novoselic, Pat Smear, and several other friends who staged an intervention at his home. During the intervention, Love reportedly threatened to leave Cobain, and his band issued an ultimatum that they would break up if he didn't enter rehab. So he agreed to rehab, but before Cobain went to the facility near Los Angeles, he purchased a gun with help from a friend. He told the friend he needed the weapon for security. After spending just two days in rehab, Staffer said he alerted them that he was stepping outside on the patio for a smoke. Then he apparently jumped over a six-foot-high wall and disappeared. Police believe he flew back to Seattle, but it's unclear what he did over the next few days. Perhaps he spent those days wandering around the city, Neighbors say they saw him in a park near his home. His wife, Courtney Love, hired a private investigator to track him down. But it's believed on April 5, 1994, Kurt Cobain went into the greenhouse above the garage and shot himself in the head with a recently purchased gun. Kurt Cobain was 27 years old. Cobain's body wasn't found until two and a half days later when that electrician looked through the window and saw a body with a 20-gauge shotgun nearby. There's a greenhouse above the garage and I, was, I walked around to the door on the upper side to, uh, to see about uh, getting access to run a wire in the house or in the garage. And I looked in through the glass door and there's this guy laying there with a shotgun laying on his chest and uh, blood running out of his ear. A medical examiner's report later revealed Cobain had a very high concentration of heroin and traces of Valium in his bloodstream. For many, Cobain's death was the end of the grunge music movement that began three years earlier. A movement that he and his band Nirvana shoved into the mainstream with the release of their single Smells Like Teen Spirit and the album Nevermind in September 1991. Following Cobain's death, Nirvana released Unplugged in New York, which had not been planned before his death. The album debuted at number one, and it won Nirvana's first and only Grammy for Best Alternative Music Performance. 1994 was actually a pretty big year for the music industry in the U.S. Record revenues jumped 11% to $11 billion, thanks to several blockbuster albums. Topping the list was the Lion King soundtrack, followed by The Sign by Ace of Bass, Two by Boys to Men, August and Everything After by Counting Crows, and rounding out the top five was Dookie by Green Day. Number one, a murder and a police chase viewed by millions. In the early morning hours of June 12, 1994, a howling dog caught the attention of several residents in the quiet, upscale Los Angeles neighborhood of Brentwood. One resident went outside to investigate and was led by a blood-spattered white Akita up a path at a townhouse condo to the scene of a violent crime. 
On the ground lay the body of Nicole Brown Simpson, the ex-wife of football legend O.J. Simpson. Nearby, another body, a young man named Ron Goldman, a waiter from a local restaurant who had dropped off a pair of glasses that Nicole's mom had left behind at dinner. It appeared he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. When news broke, police refused to identify a suspect, but the media was already swirling with rumors that O.J. Simpson had killed his ex-wife and Ron Goldman. The LA Times reported that a bloody glove had been found by police outside O.J.'s Brentwood mansion. Then two days later, this happened. What has been going on down below as uh, the uh, the presumed uh, vehicle of O.J. Simpson is still traveling very slowly northbound along the 5 freeway, uh, coming up again towards the 91 intersection. At that point, we'll just have to wait and see which way he's going to go. But uh, at this point, it's uh, still a fairly laid back situation. More than 95 million people watched as O.J. Simpson and his friend Al Cowlings, who was driving, led police on a 90-minute slow-speed chase. It all started the morning of June 17th, when the LAPD announced that O.J. Simpson would be charged with two counts of murder. He was scheduled to surrender at a police station at 11 a.m., but he failed to show. O.J.'s lawyer, Robert Kardashian, gave police the address where his client had been laying low since the murder of his wife. When officers arrived at the house, O.J. and his former teammate, Al Cowlings, took off in the now infamous white Bronco. A few hours later, O.J. called 911 from a cell phone inside the Bronco, which allowed police to track his exact location. At 6 p.m. L.A. time, the chase was officially on. And 45 minutes later, CNN broke into scheduled programming to broadcast live coverage of the chase. Uh, Okay, I'm going to have to interrupt this call. I understand we're going to go to a live picture in Los Angeles. Uh, Is that correct? Okay, this is Interstate 5, and this is courtesy of KCALR, one of our L.A. affiliates. Police believe that that O.J. Simpson is in that car. Okay, police believe he is in that vehicle. The coverage showed the white two-door Bronco driving along an empty highway, with five cruisers trailing behind at a safe distance. Over the next hour or so, viewers watched as the Bronco made its way to O.J.'s Brentwood mansion. Along the way, supporters of O.J. gathered by the hundreds at overpasses, waving signs and shouting his name. When he finally surrendered, O.J. asked to call his mom and for a glass of juice. Then he was taken to the Los Angeles County Jail and placed on suicide watch. Ten days later, the former Heisman Trophy winner made his first court appearance when he was arraigned. He vehemently stood by his innocence and told the court, Absolutely 100% not guilty. And shockingly, after his nine-month trial the next year in 1995, a jury agreed and set O.J. free. If you want to hear more about the O.J. Simpson trial and the verdict, make sure you scroll back in your feed. I was in Los Angeles at the end of O.J.'s trial and put together a special episode about the reaction to the verdict. Check it out. It aired on History of the 90s in October 2019. We've also done episodes on other stories covered in this episode, including grunge music, the assassination of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, the baseball strike, and the Rwandan genocide. If you're new to the show, please go back and check them out. Thanks for listening to this recap of 1994. Hope it brought back some memories for you. Don't forget, I love to hear from you. So if you do have a special memory from the 90s or have something you want covered, send me a message anytime. You can email the show at 90s at CuriousCast.ca. That's 90s at CuriousCast.ca. Or you can reach me through social media. I'm on Instagram at that 90s podcast. This episode was hosted and written by me, Kathy Kinzora. Our producer is Dila Velasquez, and sound design and final production is by Rob Johnston. See you next time for more History of the 90s. 